All right, good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and open up to Revelation chapter 3. So we, were, we had a break last week as we had Sunday school, uh, you know, over at the other building, as we had Dr. Carter in last week. And so it's been a couple weeks now, so let's get a little bit of a refresher. Remember where we've been in our eschatology study. Here's the timeline. You know, most all of you have been here for most of all that, so we don't need to review too much of that. We will get back to kind of constructing our time frame and our timeline later in the book of Revelation as we get into uh, the vials and the trumpets and, and all those things. We'll, we'll try to see where we want to hang those on our timeline. But that's the general uh, view that we get, that we understand, and that we teach here from the scriptures of the end times. And remember, of the day of the Lord, and going through the Old Testament, New Testament, looking at the day of the Lord, uh, what is the second coming of Christ. Uh, remember the, the star, the sun and moon stars being darkened as that sign of the day of the Lord. And we believe that there are signs that are still to come that will happen uh, to to right before this future coming seven year period. Uh, that we call the 70th week of Daniel. We don't call it the seven-year tribulation because the Bible, the scriptures don't call it the seven-year tribulation. We believe the time of tribulation starts at the middle of the week where uh, the Antichrist will reveal himself in what is Daniel calls the abomination of desolation. And then the tribulation will happen because remember the tribulation is not God's wrath upon people. The tribulation is Satan's wrath upon Christians. That's why it will be a trial and tribulation for us. Okay, so then he delivers the elect. Remember, he says that uh, those days are going to be cut short for the elect's sake. And so for his love for his, the elect and for the church, he will stop that time of tribulation, and he stops it with his coming. Okay, and so then we'll be like the day of Noah, like the day of Lot. He will separate, um, you know, the wheat and the tare, the sheep and the goats, and he will save uh, the, the righteous, and he will punish and judge the wicked. So we've gotten into the book of Revelation now. And remember John, the Apostle John, is the writer of the book of Revelation. He is in exile um, on the Isle of Patmos, about 95 A.D. or so, right before the turn of the first century there. And so he is given revelation by Jesus. Remember, Jesus comes and, and speaks to John, and he takes him. He's going to give him visions of heaven and things we're going to see moving forward, just sort of spectacular, awesome things. And he gives revelation to John to write letters to seven churches that are in the area of Asia or Asia Minor. So we've looked at a couple of those, and chapter 2 and chapter 3 are these letters to the churches. And when we get into chapter 4, uh, we're going to move on into future things, okay? And so chapter 4 uh, until the rest of the book, okay, which ends in chapter 22, we will have, uh, again, future things. So these are present things, present in the time of John, right, in the first century there. These are letters that are being written. Remember a couple of the themes that we've seen. Every one of the letters starts off with Jesus describing himself kind of in a different manner, right? Uh, the one with the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And, and just on and on with these, these different ways that he says, uh, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. And that's a description, remember, from, from him describing himself in chapter 1. So he describes himself to each church. He gives um, rebuke, if you will, to most of the churches, and then also gives instruction uh, to the churches. With the exception, I would say, on correction or rebuke, remember Smyrna, and Philadelphia. For those two churches, there aren't, isn't any really um, rebuke of you're doing this wrong. But for the other ones, we've seen, remember the main things we've seen really is idolatry, right? Whether it's he's talking about, remember Jezebel and the Nicolaitans, um, you know, and, and just giving a picture of Balaam. Remember talking about Balaam as well and saying you've allowed these false teachers and these false doctrine to come in and infiltrate your church and you need to stop that and cut that off. And some of you have done that and you've been good, the faithful remnant. But the rest of you, remember, he'll say, need to repent and turn back from those things. And remember the first church, maybe it was Sardis, he says, you need to return to your first love and be on fire for the Lord and on fire for spreading the gospel and on fire for discipling up and training up uh, the believers. And so he says, I have this against you. I have this against you. Work on this. Repent from this or I will do these things. And so uh, each one of the letters also ends in a specific way we see that they all end with him saying to the one who overcomes, right? It, they all say, he who has ears, let him hear what he says to the churches. So that's us, right? And that's everyone that's, that's read these letters from the time that John wrote them in the last 1900 years, because he who has ears hear. Well, who has ears to hear? 
believers, right? Those who he has enlightened and opened their ears to hear the truth. So this is speaking to us, not to just the seven churches, but yet they were just letters to the seven churches. Again, just the amazing uh, living thing and entity that, that God's word is and the power of God's word that continues to speak and teach, you know, all throughout uh, time. So each one of those ends with he that overcomes and he gives a different thing. Uh, and each one, he who overcomes, um, let's look at a couple of them, let's see, repent, to the one who overcomes, in verse 7, uh, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, and so remember the tree of life is going to be in heaven, um, and we went to, um, to later to chapter 22 and looked at that, some of them give to other, to he who has an ear, let him hear, to the one who conquers, the one who overcomes, I will give him heaven manna, and give him a white stone and a new name written upon it. Uh, there's just all these different ones that he gives. Verse 26 was last week's um, that we went over two weeks ago. He says, The one who conquers and keeps the work until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and you will rule with him with a rod of iron. So all these things are promises of future things that we will have in heaven and, and moving on new heaven and new earth, and even in the millennial kingdom before that to overcomers. So then who are the overcomers? Right? Who are overcomers? We are. Remember first, good, we are. First John 5, 5 tells us that. Uh, who are those that overcome? But those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, so overcomers, and that's what he's, he means in Romans 8 when he says we are more than conquerors, right? Well, how are we more than conquerors? Because we've overcome all these things. Because he has overcome all these things. Right? He's defeated and conquered death and sin and Satan and hell and all that stuff so that we through him do that okay so we are the overcomers it doesn't mean you know he that endures to the end shall be saved it doesn't mean oh you better hope you make it to the end so you be saved no it means you are saved you are an overcomer you are more than a conqueror and all these things are promises that are coming to you Okay, so uh, questions, any questions or comments on, on review there before we get started? Because I know it's been, a, like I said, a few weeks, and so maybe you've had some study time or have some thoughts or, uh, or questions on, on any of those that we've done. I think we've done four, right? In, the, in chapter two, we've done four of the churches. So we have three left here in chapter three. Everybody needs their coffee still, not wait, not, not, not alive yet. Okay, well, let's get right into it. Let's... Uh, Let's read verse 1 of chapter 3, and uh, let's read through the first two churches. Maybe we'll have time to do that. Can somebody read verse 1 to 13 for us? Who could do that nice and loud for us? See, I'm going to put you on the spot to make you wake up and talk a little bit and get going here a little bit. I'll thank, do it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, to the church of Sardis, and to the angel of the church of Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Hmm. Yet you have still few names in Sardis people who have not soiled their garments and they walk with me, in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed, thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, <coughs> to the seven churches of Philadelphia. And the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about my patience and patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write him the name of my God 
and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this text. Thank you for this time that we have to gather together to um, read your word and be taught by you. And so instruct us, um, grant us knowledge and understanding of the things we read today. As it says, to him who has an ear, Lord, open our ears uh, to understand the things you have for us this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. One, a few things probably stuck out there, hopefully, um, in your mind as you hear them, as we've talked about some of these things already through our study. Uh, particularly the come like a thief, right? We see that here again, so we'll, we'll see that here in a moment. Uh, but here's the first one, to the church in Sardis. I think, again, I think this is our fifth letter. He says to this church, you have a name and are alive, but are now dead. Um, he commends them, certainly for a few of them, right? It says to the, this remnant he talks about. Um, but he talks about repenting or facing consequences, so look there, it says you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So what, what would that mean? What do, we, what, do you think, what do we think that means? How can you be alive and be dead? Spiritually. Okay. Any expounding on, on that? Like the reputation, everyone looks at them like, you know, they're the church and stuff. Good. Doing good things and doing what's all good. Good. Yeah, because certainly the Lord tries our hearts, right? The Lord knows our hearts. The Lord knows our motives and knows if you're doing things for the right intentions and the right motives or not. Um, so certainly it's easy to put on, like you said, being being a put on a church face, or maybe we we think we're strong or we have a good appearance maybe on the outside to the community around us. Uh, but the Lord knows who we really are and how we really are. And so he says that right there in verse 2. He says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. So yeah, again, kind of like that first church where he mentions uh, you've gone away from your first love. You're losing your first love. You're, you're losing the fire. You're, you're losing the drive that you should have um, you know, through Christ and by his spirit, and you're losing your way. And so that certainly could be complacency. It can be false doctrine and false teachers coming in, which he's addressed to some of these other churches as well. And so he says, I have found your works not complete in the sight of my God. You're not doing the things that you need to be doing. And so strengthen up, wake up now before the rest of it dies. See it? Before, before you totally um, go down the tubes here. Because there is this, uh, this remnant and, and people that, that I think there's always the picture of remnant through scriptures. And so uh, there's this remnant of that. Well, you guys, the rest of you need to repent and you need to wake up. Okay, and remember, he says, what you've received and had heard, and keep that and repent. And then he says, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come against you. There's that thief in the night uh, wording and verbiage again, right? Which we've seen before in 1 Thessalonians 5. It's also in 2 Peter 3. And what's the key when we went to those two passages? What was the key about the thought of of Behold, I come like a thief. Or remember, Paul's talking about, he says, the day of the Lord comes like a thief. Peter says, the day of the Lord it will be like a thief in the night. What, what's the context? What do we take home from that? What do we think about that? Does that mean he's coming like a thief? It's going to be secret? We don't know what he's coming? No, that's not it. Because, I mean, it says in Revelations that he will not, the day of the Lord happens when all of his enemies are at his footstool. Good. Good answer. Yeah, so, so, that is what we believe. We don't believe it is a secret thing. Look at what he says there. He says, if you will not wake up. Right? So what would it mean to wake up? It means what we've seen in so many other places. Be watching. Be on alert. Be on guard. Right? We've seen that over and over and over everywhere. Keep and if you're not watching, if you're not on alert, if you're not looking for it, then <laughs> you are complacent. You won't be ready. So he's saying, if you will not watch and wake up, then I'm coming like a thief. Why? Because you're going to be not understanding what's happening. And then I will come and you know, won't know what's happened. So certainly we know non-believers on the day of the Lord, it will be secretive to them, right? They're in the dark. They're the ones that are thieves in, in excuse me, that it will be like a thief in the night because they don't know what's happening. But you see also, I think we can derive from this here as well. This, this letter is written to who? Non-believers? This is written to a church, the, uh, believers in Sardis, of a, of a church in Asia. So 
he's writing to believers saying this. So we can certainly derive and understand, too, that there are believers who are going to be ignorant to the, to the things of the, the coming of Christ and to the day of the Lord. Um, so just because they have different thoughts or different teachings or things that they've learned or they just are immature or newer believers, certainly whatever the case may be, um, he's saying don't, don't be like that. Right? You need to, to wake up, do the things you know to do, be ready, be looking, be on alert, always be mindful. Remember, we're supposed to be frontline warriors, right? We're not supposed to be reserves that are just sitting on the bench ready to go, um, you know, if, if they need me or if they need us. We're supposed to be armed with the whole armor of God, frontline service warriors ready to be going, ready to be looking out for the enemy, knowing that the enemy is out there, knowing what the Lord uh, has called us to do and what the Lord has promised. We need to be understanding those things and be equipped with those things. So you dig it up there, bro. You got something? No? Good. Okay, so we talked about that. If you don't watch, okay, and uh, Thessalonians 4, we have talked about that already as well. So he says, you still have some names and some people have not sold their garments. So we're talking about, again, the, the ones that are worthy, he says. So we have this remnant picture again there. Verse 5 says, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garment, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Go back to chapter 19 for me. So we've seen each one of these where it says, he who conquers and the promise, and we try to go later in the book, and I try to show you where... I think we see a fulfillment of, of that coming. So the one who conquers will be clothed in white garments, never blot him out of the book of life. What is this book of life he's talking about? Thoughts on that? I know we've talked in, a, in passing a little bit. What, what's that all about? All the people going to heaven. Good. Yeah, the book of life would imply eternal life, correct? Mm -hmm. Those who are written in that book um, are, are those with eternal life. Okay, look at chapter 19. Let's look at verse 8. This is uh, what's called is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, this is in heaven. This is after the day of the Lord has already commenced. And um, the, the rapture, the first resurrection has happened at this point. It says, uh, look at verse 7. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his bride has made herself ready. Well, who is his bride? Church. Good, the church. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And we see in Ephesians, I believe it is, where Paul talks about one day the Lord will present to himself a, a blameless, spotless, a pure bride. Okay, and so this is when this is going to happen. When we are in heaven, presented to him as this pure bride. We will have white clothing and raiments, and we'll, we'll find out that in other chapters as well. Okay, so that's what this is talking about. And certainly the book of life, as Shannon um, unpacked for us, is exactly that. The books will be opened. We talked about that before, that uh, believers will, have, will be written in the book of life. And so we are, are given salvation because why? Because of God's grace and mercy that we have been saved. So we are written in that book. Those who are written in the book are going to be saved. Those are the sheep, right? So the other books it talks about are the books that people are going to be judged by, remember, according to their deeds. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago in, in depth about if you're judged according to your deeds, you're already condemned, correct? You're already condemned. We're already in trouble, okay? So we don't want to be judged for salvation according to our deeds. Uh, back to Revelation 3. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, let us hear then what he says to the churches, right? Let's find application in each one of these letters. Certainly we can uh, apply things, and I, I hope we've done a good job of, of that so far in and, and all these letters. What can be something maybe we can find application in these, these six verses here of this letter to, to Sardis? What's something that maybe sticks out to you guys? Okay, faith without works is dead. Good James, right? Yeah, I think that sums it up pretty well. Any other any other thoughts? Okay. Be watchful for the signs. Yeah, be be always watching, always ready. Because um, whether whether the day of the Lord happens while we're alive or not, we certainly <coughs> want to be watching 
and, and watching and, and guarding, you know, this church, certainly our own local church, but watching and seeing what the Lord is doing in his church around the world and watching, look, our, our enemy, watch the world, keep an eye on the world, keep an eye on other religions, keep an eye on things that are happening. We should be educated on these things so that we know what's happening. You understand? You, sh you should know your enemy well uh, to, is a good tactic, correct? We should understand the things of the world and the ways of the world, um, you know, to not be guarded from them and sheltered from them and surprised by that because we need to know how to deal with that, right? We need to know how to have intelligent conversations, communications with people in the world that have these different worldviews than we do so that we can use that to share with them, just like what Dr. Carter was talking about, to be more equipped, like certainly someone like him can talk about in, in the, the means of science with other scientists and you know other scholars that are maybe many, many levels and higher of, of scholastic intelligence than maybe we are. They can have those on, on different levels, but we need to be able to have that with our family members and with our, our neighbors and with Tuesday night people and with everyone around us. So uh, we certainly got to be watching and be mindful of those things. Okay, let's move on to Philadelphia. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he commends them for keeping his word and not denying him. That's certainly great accommodation. Yes, I, I, de I definitely want us to be commended for keeping his word and not denying him. Uh, that's definitely what we want to, to be doing. It says, the words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. So I think we're probably going to spend some more time here in Philadelphia. The words of the Holy One. Well, we know who that is, right? Because, again, he's, he's describing himself in another way, just like he's done different ways for each letter so far. So the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David, that's interesting. What might that mean? What do we think about when we think about the key of David? We're going to see imagery of keys later. It says that, actually we saw in, in chapter 1, it says he has the key of hell and, and death. Okay, Jesus does. Uh, we're going to see that there's an angel who has the key to a bottomless pit. Uh, we're going to see that later. So what would this mean about this key uh, that Jesus has the key of David. The key to entrance of heaven? No, but I don't know what it has to do with David, to be honest with you. <laughs> good. Hey, well, well, that's a good one because when he goes in next into who opens and no one will shut and shuts and no one opens, that's certainly applicable to what you're saying, Greg, right? Who is the one that opens hearts to be saved? Who is the one that opens the door to heaven? Uh, in John 10, I think about Jesus uh, talks about, you know, I'm the good shepherd and, and my sheep I know my name and they follow me when I call them. Well, he says also in there, he says, not only am I just the shepherd, he says, I am the door or I'm the gate, some versions say. So not only is he the shepherd that shepherds you, but he is the door and the gate that opens and allows you to come in. See it? That's the picture. So yeah, what door he opens, no one will shut because those <coughs> will come in the door. But the door that he shuts, no one can open it because they are not allowed in. So certainly that's that's correct. Um, yeah, and the David, what would the thoughts be with that? Why, why would it mention David here? Jesus being in the line of David. Yeah. Good. Yeah, doesn't scripture say he is, you know, the root of Jesse, um, that he's from David, right? Uh, we know that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we certainly understand his lineage. Uh, and, the, and that really, if you follow, if you want to call it that righteous line, um, really goes all the way back to Adam, right? It goes back to Adam's son, Seth. And so you can train that lineage from Seth all the way down, you know, to Noah and then to Abraham and, and to Shem and uh, to down, to, down and down, on and on and on and on, you know, to Jesse, to David, to Solomon. And so um, the line of who would, uh, the line of, of Judah is the line of kings, right? The line of David is the line of kings. We know that the, Jesus is the king of kings, right? So he came through the line of David as the king. Um, and so, yes, um, the Messiah, okay? The Messiah was prophesied all through the Old Testament to come through the line of David, okay? To come through and to be that, that root of Jesse. So, again, just referring back to fulfillments of Jesus is the fulfillment, he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the one he claimed to be. He is the one God sent to save his people from their sins. Okay? So that's that, that picture encompassing David there. And, and who opens, no one shuts. And who shuts, no one opens. So another description there of Christ uh, giving himself to this church. He says in verse 8, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door 
which no one is able to shut. There you go again. An open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. That's interesting because look in there. He kind of gives a little bit of a rebuke there, right? He gives a little prod there saying you have little power. You see it? But yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So look, you've been faithful and you've been steadfast and you've been good keeping my word, not denying me, and you, and you, but yet you're little. You see it? So you have this little bit and you've been doing this. So certainly application would be what? You need more. You, you need to grow more in your faith. You need to get stronger um, so that you can then even accomplish more than the things that you're doing. You're doing well by keeping my namesake and keeping my word, but you can be better and, and you can be stronger and you can do more. Okay, um, so, so that can certainly be applicable to each one of us individually, right? And, and certainly corporately as well. The next he switches here. Look at verse 9. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. There's a lot in that verse. So what does that mean? Anybody want to try to discuss and paint a picture for us? What is he talking about here? What? Who are the synagogue of Satan? who say that they are Jews and are not. What does that even mean? How can you be Jew and not be a Jew? Sincere. Okay. They're the, the Jews that are not going to be saved. Okay. Yep, certainly sounds like non-believers, right, that, that, they're, that he's talking about. So the synagogue of Satan, I would say, is certainly non-believers, right? Um, and he's using a word synagogue there, Jewish word, okay? Um, that they are Jews and are not. So what would that mean? Let's, let's unpack that a little bit more. What does it mean to be a Jew and not be a Jew? Anything that you think of from, like, um, Romans chapter 11, um, Romans right in there where Paul's talking about the Jews and talking about Israel, um, you've heard me talk about it a lot. You know, the ethnic Israel and the spiritual Israel. What, what is that whole picture about? Somebody else can say it probably just as well as I can. What is that? What, is, what do I mean? There's ethnic Israel and there's spiritual Israel. The ones What's that the claim they're the lineage of Abraham but really don't love God. They just do right. it for them. And so they don't the love God because why? They're evil. They are, in which we all are evil and don't love God until what? until God has loved us and saves us. And so that's the key, is remember, he says, Israel has not obtained what they seek for, but the elect have, is what it says in Romans 11, Paul says. So in one verse there, he says, the elect are not necessarily Israel. You see it? He says, Israel didn't get it, but the elect have gotten it. What? Salvation through Christ. The elect can be Jew, Gentile, male, female, right? We're all, it's all the same. The elect are one body, one flock of sheep. So those who are ethnic Israel, they thought that they were saved just on the premise, like I said, of being children. We're children of Abraham. Well, you can raise up children of Abraham from these rocks. You know, that, that doesn't mean anything. Um, and in and, and 1 Corinthians 10, I think about this a couple of weeks ago, guys, we went through the, all went through the desert. All of Israel were led by the cloud, uh, during the day and the pillar of fire by the night they all walked across the red sea on dry ground to the other side they were all partaker in the manna that was given by god from heaven they were all partakers of the spiritual water that flowed from the rock which was christ paul tells us in first corinthians 10 all of them got that but you know what the next verse says but most of them god was not pleased with and they perished in the wilderness so how does that make sense God's goodness was upon all of them, certainly, because God's goodness is upon all of creation, even non-believers, right? The, the rain falls on the just and what? And the, unjust. the unjust alike, okay? Not just on our garden back here because we're believers, but not them next door because they're not. God is good all the time, everywhere. But the, the extra awesome goodness of his grace and mercy of salvation is given to those who are his sheep and to those he opens the door. And so that's the picture here is... 
the Jews that they're talking about are obviously non-believers, okay? Non-believing Jews, they are the synagogue of Satan, they lie. And what he says here, to he says, I will make them bow down before your feet. Don't think that we're so high and mighty and that that's what's going to happen, but that certainly is going to be revealing later. Think about the millennial kingdom. Think about we will rule and reign with him, right? We're ruling and reigning with him. What does that mean? That means we are overseeing others. We're overseeing people. And certainly if they're a synagogue of Satan and they're not believers, they're going in hell. So they understand we will be with Christ, okay? And he's saying, remember that. And that, in, in that, he says, they will learn that I have loved you. See it? They will understand. Esau understands that God loved Jacob, right? He knows that for sure. Everyone's got to understand who God loves. He loves his children. Okay, and, and all will one day know that. Thoughts, comments, questions there? Yes? Yeah, there's some there's some Jews that uh, that come around and become messianic and all that, but some of them don't, obviously. And he must be, he sure, he's surely talking about the ones that don't. And, yeah. then, uh, and then I noticed there's another thing in there where, um, at least in my version, and it said something like, I'll, I'll keep you from the hour of temptation. And okay, we'll get those there. Those pre-trip rapture people are, you know, they probably capitalize on that one pretty big. Good. Um, yeah, what verse is that? We're, um, we're going there. And I got off my notes there for a minute. It's uh, next on my verse. Ten. <coughs> yep, here we go. Verse 10. Thank you, Duff. Good, good segue right into it. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Okay, so pause right there. Duff makes a very good point. Um that we're going to spend a little bit of time on here now. We've got 10 minutes, so we're good. This verse is often, 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 always, I would say, in any pre-trib dispensational church taught to say, see, this is doctrine right here that says he will keep you from the tribulation. See it? I will keep you from the hour of trial or temptation. That word can also be uh, translated as, okay? Tribulation. I will keep you from that that is coming upon the world. So they use this to support a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? So a couple places we can go that with that. One I want to start with is I believe it's not very I believe it's a very poor handling of scripture to proof text one verse to say this is what this means. Especially when let's go back and other ones. Uh, let me see if I can find where it says it was actually two weeks ago. We looked at, look at verse 22 of chapter 2. There was a couple of these, and actually I'm thinking of one even before that. Um, there was one, remember, let's go back to Smyrna. Let's go back to chapter 2, verse 10. He says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in a prison, that you may be tested for ten days you will have tribulation. Do you see that? So he's saying to that church, remember we already went over that, that you are going to suffer tribulation. It's coming. And be ready for it. Look now at chapter 2, verse 22. He says here to Thyatira, another church, Behold, I will throw her, that meaning is the Jezebel, it's referring back to that false teaching, false teachers, false doctrine. I will throw her on a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, meaning from out of this church, I will throw them into great tribulation. Do you see that? So it's very bad handling, in my opinion, of the word to say, well, we're going to take Revelation 3, verse 10, and we're going to say, look, you're not going to be here for tribulation because God says, I will remove you. Because you've been faithful, I will keep you from the hour of tribulation. I would dare argue and say that the church today is not very faithful, in my opinion, okay, so that we wouldn't be kept from the hour of tribulation. But my point being, the bigger point is, why not proof text and... And, and pull our text from the other two that he says, I will throw you into tribulation. Two churches, he says, you're going to go into tribulation. And one says, he's, you're not. So why would we as a church today across the world say, well, we're going to be taken out before it gets hard in a secret rapture that could happen today because it says here that I'll remove you from the hour of temptation. Do you understand? Am I articulating that well enough? Why would we say that is the verse that we should hold on to? Why don't we hold on to the verse... 22 that says, I will throw you into great tribulation. 
Right, because it's easier to swallow, right? It's much easier to teach that. No other churches are saying, be ready for the tribulation, because it says right here he's going to throw us into tribulation. Nobody else really says that. But the, majority of, but the majority of the church says, well, this verse says we're not going to be here for tribulation, so we're not. It fits into, see, that, that easy to swallow, easy to tolerate, light teaching of, don't worry about the hard stuff, we're not going to be here. Yet, again, all of Scripture says you will have tribulation, you will have trials, you will have temptations. So I would say, let's, let's lean on the 99 pieces of the puzzle that say that, and not try to misrepresent this one piece of the puzzle that says you won't have tribulation. In context, who is he talking to here? A church in the first century. A church is made up of who? Believers. So he's saying to these believers, because you've kept this, I will keep you from this hour of temptation that's coming. Well, with the next five minutes, I will try to show you what I believe is this hour of, of temptation. Because, look, he says hour of trial or temptation. Nowhere in Scripture is this time that we're talking about of tribulation in, this, in the seven-year period. Nowhere is it called an hour. Okay? It doesn't say in here anywhere about seven years. It doesn't say anywhere in here about three and a half years. Right? It doesn't say anything in here. It says an hour of tribulation. Right? So that doesn't fit with seven years anyway. It, because why would it say just an hour? Why would we call it an hour? Okay, well, a thousand years is, is a day with the Lord and all those things. His time is, is perfect and it's different. But I want you to see a couple of things here. Sorry, do you have a little comment there? Um, look at chapter 14. Let's get forward to chapter 14. This hour is referred to a few more times in the book of Revelation. So maybe the rest of his letter and, and other parts of Scripture can give us context of what we're doing. And look, isn't that part of our hermeneutic? Let's find out what the, the context of Scripture says to define Scripture instead of just our teaching that we don't want to be here for tough stuff. Okay, chapter uh, 14, look at verse 7. It says, And he said with a loud voice, this is an angel, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment is come. So there's the word hour. And what does it say in relation to? His judgment. Flip forward to chapter 17. Verse 12. says, And ten horns that you saw are ten kings. We'll get into all this a little bit later. Who have not yet received power. Okay, these ten kingdoms. But they are going to receive authority as kings for one hour. See the word hour again? And this is right before the time that God's wrath is going to be poured out. Go to chapter 18, please, if you would. Verse 10. It says, They will stand far off in fear of torment and say, Alas, alas, your great city, your mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. Look over at verse 17. For in a single hour... All this wealth has been laid to waste. Verse 19 says, In a single hour she has been laid to waste. This is talking about a city that the Antichrist is going to be in at that time. And so here's the, the picture that I'm trying to paint for you. Um, I'll sum it up in 30 seconds, and then we'll have two minutes to, of discussion and questions. This hour, in the four or five contexts that we've seen, seems to be talking about God's judgment. Okay, that is coming upon the world. And he says, I'll keep you from the hour of the trial that's coming upon the whole world, meaning the rest of the world. If I'm keeping you from the hour, who's it going on? The rest of everyone else. So I would say this hour he's referring to is the wrath of God that's going to be poured out upon the day of the Lord after the resurrection. You understand? So the tribulation starts, the Antichrist is killing people, Jesus, the sun, moon, stars are darkened. Jesus comes. What's the first thing that happens then? Dead bodies come out of the ground, and we who are alive are made go up. We go up for the rapture. Then what happens next? God pours out his wrath and judgment upon all non-believers on the world. That is the hour of God's judgment. It seems to be referred to in Revelation here four or five times as the hour of his judgment. So it certainly doesn't mean a literal hour. Because I, we're going to see that it, one of the plagues coming lasts for over five for five months, 
And this time period, again, however long it is, we don't know exactly, could be a couple years. So that whole time frame is being referred to as this hour that will come upon the earth. Thoughts, questions, does that, does that make sense? I don't know if I said that well enough or not. Or does it, and that would be, there's a, an option I'm presenting to you that that's a possibility, or does it mean that there, this hour is talking about the seven years of tribulation and we're not going to go through that because of this one verse? Do you see the difference? Two huge difference of, of interpretation here. How much? There's something I see in this, and that uh, it, it almost seems like the Church of Philadelphia is like he's talking specifically to Messianic Jews or something. Mm. And then in the previous one, one of the previous ones just before that, uh, he, they said something about the the so-called deep secrets of Satan and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. that's that's something that those esoteric organizations believe that wear the goatskin pants and they reside at the top of a lot of U.S. companies and a lot of them. Okay. I mean, it's so it's. Uh, and there's a guy who talks about that on YouTube, a guy named William Schnevlin, I think, who said he was in those organizations and defected from them, and he was telling everything about them. Yep. And there's I, a lot I've, of that out there. And I've observed a few things, because uh, I've observed a few things that seem to back up what he says. So uh, that, that's really interesting that he's talking about these two right close together, like as if there's, like I, I know I'm not like, bigoted or anything, but I know that a lot of Jews own really big media organizations sure. and are, they're all saying one thing, like they all pass a memo to one another, like what they're going to say today and what they're going to say tomorrow. Sure. And it's just, it's interesting that he's putting those two very close together in that passage. Yeah, and there's a lot of that. Certainly we can go down that trail. I'm going to hold us off from that. we got one, one more minute, but um, yeah, no, thank you, Duff. Very, very true and very interesting to see how it's all going to unpack. You know, how it's all yeah. going to unfold. Uh, Sky, you had something, too? I just noticed it in my King James that I have. It says it's the hour of temptation. Yes. Yeah, temptation or trial, same, um, yep, same situation. Which come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Mm -hmm. Like, try, I can see that's like judgment. But um, right. the temptation to me is odd because it's like, that's like the tribulation time. Like that's like the wrath. That seems really bad. But like, what's tempting about that? For those, to, it's so it's like to go to the, the antichrist or the. Um, it's meaning like uh, so kind of not like maybe a physical temptation that you might have because I'm hungry right now and I want to eat Duff's donut or something. It's more of it. it the, that word there that is it's translated tempting or tempt is also that's why it's also uh, translated trial, which would be more. That, that's what that word tempt in that context means. It doesn't mean tempting in, in the sense we're thinking. It means trying, like what you said a couple of, a couple of words later, you said to try. That would be the context of what it's meaning. Um, so not tempting in the sense that we think of in physical temptation or something. It means a trial and a testing. You know, that, that's what that means. It's like when you're being tribulated and everything, you're tempted to give up and say, I don't, I'm not doing this... Uh, you know, godly thing anymore, or whatever. You're, that's a, you're tempted to. You know, and to your down. point, Sky, like you said, it does seem the context, the flow, everything about it is talking about. Especially when we pull the other pieces that we'll get to later, that I just kind of took you to a couple of those real quick. Is the trial is the testing is on the rest of the world of of judgment. So this is God saying, "I'm the judge." This is a time of trial for you. And there's going to come trials later where the books are open, you know, and all the, the second death and all that stuff. Um, but that's God's wrath being poured, upon, being poured out. Um, so we do not, you know, believe that that's talking about the tribulation that we go through. Like you said, the tribulation we go through happens before that. And then we're saved, and then comes the hour of his judgment. Because remember, his judgment and his wrath is not upon his children. Okay, First Thessalonians 4, nine says, we are not appointed unto wrath unto God's wrath. Okay, so God's wrath is not upon us because we're his children. He protects us from that and takes us out of that. And when we get to the next couple of verses next week, it talks about that, that Isn't he that keeps us from that. the same principle as in uh, when our judgment, we're on the Bema seat instead of the uh, judgment seat? A little bit. I know you and I have talked about that before. Um, a little bit. Bema seat just means judgment seat. Uh, but we're, we're judged differently. 
Yes, because we're not because we're not judged for salvation according to our works, right? We're saved be, uh, by Christ, so we're written in the book of Lamb, uh, the book of life, in the book, the Lamb's book of life. So those who are not saved are going to be judged differently. Yes, because right, why? They're going to be the judged through their works. Down, like, That's right. Done, like, right. That's right. We've right. already been deemed righteous. We've already been deemed uh, innocent, though we are not. Right? We've right, been right. declared righteous and innocent by God. Uh, therefore, we're saved and, and not damned by our works because every one of us would be, right? Good. Well, we got to pray. we got to close. Greg, would you pray for us? Thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this teaching today. Thank you for your word. Thank you mm-hmm. for you know, all the blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day, Father, that we're not worthy of. We thank you, obviously, for salvation, your mm-hmm. son. Um, we pray that uh, you continue to guide this church and everyone here and bless over the faithful saints of yours uh, continue to draw us near and may we continue to grow uh, may we become more and more like Christ in mm-hmm. sanctification we pray that uh, we move on from spiritual milk to solid food Father for everyone here at this table and our congregation and our communities uh, bless over Pastor Brian today as he brings your word the next mm-hmm. hour may those who hear your word their eyes be opened yeah. their hearts pricked and their ears uh, receiving. Mm-hmm. Uh, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you.